first. Sergeants, can we please start our recordings? DC recording underway. Cloud started. Back up is rolling. Okay, so good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Environmental Protection. At this time, would council staff please turn on their video? Please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. That is testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you. We are ready to begin. Chairman, we're ready to start. Okay, great. I just wasn't sure who, who starts. It's it's like kind of like a dance. Try to figure out who's supposed to go first. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, I am Costa Constantinidis, uh, Chair of the Environmental Protection Committee, uh, and today's hearing is on NYSERDA's offshore wind energy proposal to develop 9,000 megawatts of wind energy by 2035. In July, NYSERDA's second offshore wind procurement was announced, seeking an additional 2,400 megawatts of generating capacity and a complementary multi-port uh, uh, infrastructure investment that will bring New York's total commitment to more than 400 million in public and private funds for port infrastructure in the past year, the largest infrastructure commitment to offshore wind in the nation. There are th currently three offshore wind projects under active development statewide with a combined total of 1,826 megawatts. The Empire Wind Project has capacity of 816 megawatts and has been developed by Equinor Wind US LLC. The site is approximately 14 miles from Jones Beach State Park at its closest point and is expected to begin commercial operation in 2024. The project will connect to the grid at the Gowana substation in Brooklyn. Uh, the Sunrise Wind Project has capacity of 880 megawatts as developed by Sunrise Wind LLC. The project is more than 30 miles east off the east coast of Long Island at the closest point, as an expected to bring commercial operation around 2024 as well. The project will connect to the grid at the Holbrook substation in central Long Island. Uh, the Empire and Sunrise projects are expected to power more than 1 million New York homes. Finally, in the South Fork offshore wind farm, which has capacity for 130 megawatts and is located five miles east of Montauk. It is expected to provide enough renewable energy for 70,000 homes and offset 300,000 tons of carbon emissions annually. New York City's uh, the current means of, of energy production are generally high emission intensity. It is estimated that each megawatt hour of energy produced by offshore wind will avoid 800 kilograms of carbon emissions. Using these figures, a 2,400 megawatt wind farm could potentially avoid 7,280,000 metric tons of CO2 annually, the equivalent of removing 1.6 million cars. That's a big number from the road. NYSERDA's uh, estimates are slightly more conservative at 5 million short tons of, an of CO2 annually, the equivalent of moving just a million cars from the road annually from the road. Offshore wind technologies do not discharge any wastewater, produce any solid waste while creating electricity. Wind-based generation also does not produce significant air emissions or greenhouse gases. As these technologies do not create any air significant pollution while generating electricity, there'll be substantial environmental benefits resulting from employing wind technologies in New York City, where air quality is such, has a huge impact on respiratory and cardiopulmonary disease. As recently codified by the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, New York State is supporting the development of 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind by 2035. This will provide enough energy to power 6 million homes. 
Well, some environmentalists suggest that large-scale offshore wind projects could help transition the city and the region onto a renewable energy resources. Others have pointed out there are potentially negative impacts associated with the construction of infrastructure on the continental shelf. Some potentially adverse impacts include disturbing sediment in the water column, increasing turbidity, and likelihood of re-suspending sediment-bound pollutants potentially affecting the spawn of certain fish species and temporary increase in boat strike risk correlated with the increase in boat traffic in the area. U.S. offshore wind resources are abundant today, a technical uh, potential of 2,058 gigawatts of offshore wind resource capacity are accessible in U.S. waters using existing technology. This is the equivalent of the energy output of 7,200 terawatt hours per year, enough to provide nearly double the total electric generation in the U.S. in 2015. NYSERDA's, uh, NYSERDA's proposed offshore wind proposal could also propose a combined economic impact of $3.2 billion statewide and the support creation of 1,600 jobs, a benefit sorely needed during this time of severe economic crisis. These economic benefits do not include the direct, indirect costs avoided to society like illnesses or death. To achieve these benefits, we'll need to make changes. The future for energy use in America is renewable energy, including wind power. There is simply no way to achieve our aims of good environmental quality and abundant energy for our lifestyles with continued fossil fuel usage. Before I begin, I want to thank our committee staff, our committee council, who will be uh, sort of hosting the hearing today, Samara Swanston, our policy analysts, Nadia Johnson and Nikki Chawla, our financial analyst, Jonathan Seltzer, my legislative director and counsel, Nicholas Blazowski, for all their hard work. I also want to give thanks to my outgoing, uh, he left on Monday, uh, our communications director, Talis Cullen, who's gone on to uh, new new pastures, but I wish him well and thank him to his service to our office and to our committee. And I want to wish everyone a very safe, very socially distant uh, uh, Thanksgiving as we continue to battle COVID-19. COVID-19 is very real. We need to stay safe. So I, I am using this opportunity on my soapbox as, a, as this hearing to just say, everyone, please stay safe this holiday. With that, I will pass it back to our Great Committee Council, Samara Swanston, to swear in our beginning witnesses. Thank you. Um, before I swear in the witnesses, I'm going to go over the hearing procedures. Um, I'm Samara Swanston, counsel to the committee. Um, I want to remind you that you'll be on mute until you're called on to testify when you'll be unmuted by the host. I'll be calling pa on panelists to testify, listen for your name to be called. I will be period periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. We will begin with testimony from the administration, which will be followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function. The, the council member will call on you in the order that you used it. Uh, during the hearing, if council members would like to answer a question, again, use the Zoom raise hand function. Um, this morning, we will be limiting the wind producers to uh, 10 minutes and others to three minutes it, for their testimony. <clears throat> um, and now I would like to turn to the oath and I would deliver the oath and I will call on each member of the administration to record your answers. So um, is everyone here? Good morning. Morning. Okay, Suzanne, do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee, and to return and to respond honestly to the council member questions? Yes. And Anthony, do you? Yes. Do you? <laughs> you're already saying yes. <laughs> yes. Okay, and, and uh, responding honestly. And finally, Nessie Esma, um, Assistant Vice President for Smart Cities and Sustainable, Smart and Sustainable Cities. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth today? 
and to answer and to uh, respond honestly to the council member questions. Yes. Thank you. You may begin when ready. Before anyone gives their testimony, I just want to quickly acknowledge that we're joined by both Councilmember Yeager and Councilmember Menchaka, members of the committee from Brooklyn. Thank you. Great. Good morning. My name is Suzanne DeRoche, and I am the Deputy Director for Infrastructure and Energy at the Mayor's Office of Resiliency and the Mayor's Office of Sustainability. I am joined here today by Anthony Fiore, Deputy Commissioner at the Department of Citywide Administrative Services and Chief Energy Management Officer, and Ensei Asima, Assistant Vice President at the New York City Economic Development Corporation. I wanna thank Chairperson Constantinides and members of the committee for this opportunity to testify on behalf of the de Blasio administration on the current state of offshore wind. As part of our Green New Deal, Mayor de Blasio committed New York City to 100% clean electricity by 2040 and carbon neutrality by 2050. This requires a shift to renewable energy from many sources from rooftop to solar to utility scale renewables to energy storage. At the same time, we are committed to an energy transition that will increase resilience to climate change while maintaining energy affordability for all New Yorkers. Offshore wind has an important role to play in the decarbonization of New York City's electric grid. Through the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act or CLCPA, the state committed to procuring at least nine gigawatts of offshore wind by 2035. We understand that we need a significant share of that resource and potentially more to decarbonize our city's electric grid. When we model our future grid, we need to take into consideration space constraints, resource diversity, reliability, and affordability. One pathway we have modeled that achieved, achieves a 70% clean grid by 2030 includes one gigawatt of solar on our buildings, three gigawatts of offshore wind, and one gigawatt of hydro connecting through new transmission, combined with 500 megawatts of storage located in the city. This modeling underscores that in order for the city to clean its grid, we need all available resources. There is no silver bullet, and we need to move quickly to ensure they are delivered into New York City. Offshore wind has unique features that make it one attractive resource for our city. First, because of our coastal location, offshore wind can directly connect utility scale renewable energy into our grid. Second, the city lacks available space for siting renewables. Because offshore wind is not competing for land space within the five boroughs, we can use any available land space for storage and solar. Third, offshore wind has a capacity factor of approximately 50%, meaning that installations are producing power on average 50% of the time. This means it can provide power for more hours of the day than other intermittent renewable resources. When paired with substantial amounts of local energy storage and hydropower, offshore wind can be saved and used when the wind isn't blowing or on our peakiest demand days reducing our reliance on in-city fossil units and avoiding their associated negative health impacts. In addition, there are exciting economic development benefits that can be unlocked if New York City can become an offshore wind hub. The supply chain in this industry will create jobs in New York City in staging, assembly, and operations and maintenance. Additionally, there will be workforce and business development opportunities created in a range of maritime fields as well as in research and development to advance innovation in this burgeoning industry. As ports facilities are critical to supporting various components of the offshore wind supply chain, this industry presents an opportunity for investment in maritime assets across the city, such as the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal or SBMT. SBMT is currently competing in an open procurement for state funding to support upgrades that would enable it to be used by the offshore wind industry, including for staging and installation of components, as well as wind farm operations and maintenance. Estimates project that up to 350 to 500 direct jobs will be created by the current proposed investments at SBMT including anywhere from 60 to 100 well-paying jobs in operations and maintenance. 
Unlocking this amount of offshore wind within the next decade will require an all hands on deck effort. At the federal level, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management or BOEM can unlock additional lease space as needed to meet our goals. The state will play a central role in to plan, implement and finance installations, particularly through its electric ratepayer funded solicitations and regulatory authority over the utilities. Developers will need to navigate a relatively new environment for siting and constructing their projects while driving down costs to consumers. Con Edison and the New York Independent System Operator will need to prepare their infrastructure to be able to receive this large influx of new intermittent power. The city has and will continue to be a strong advocate for New York City residents in all regulatory proceedings at the state and federal level. From sitting on BOEM's Intergovernmental Renewable Energy Task Force to advocating for the state's creation of financial instruments that support renewables, to participating in the offshore wind procurement processes and planning for relevant transmission and distribution upgrades. Through the work of EDC, we are playing a driving role in unlocking the local economic development benefits of these projects. Finally, as more projects enter further stages of development, we are preparing to be involved in facilitating local siting of necessary infrastructure. In conclusion, achieving our climate goals will require unlocking a variety of clean energy resources and offshore wind has a critical role to play. Moreover, as we continue our economic recovery from COVID-19, we are excited about the catalytic role offshore wind can play in creating jobs and sparking economic development. We appreciate the opportunity to testify at this hearing and look forward to further opportunities to collaborate in this new renewable energy space. Thank you for your time, and we would be happy to answer any questions. Okay, Suzanne, thank you for your testimony. Um, so I guess the first question I have is, how do we sort of envision New York City's role in sort of expanding this base, right? Like we, we've talked, you talked about in your testimony, the need for even more, um, offshore wind that we're getting the majority of it. How are we working with the state? How are we you know, lobbying with the governor? Like, how are we working? What, what levers are we pushing here to make sure that we're getting the, the share of renewable energy, in particular wind energy, that we need as a city to move forward? Thank you, Chair. So uh, the city is in regular conversations with NYSERDA regarding their full offshore wind program. Um, we have regular communications about planning um, and uh, we have submitted official proposals into the public <clears throat> policy transmission needs, basically showing that we need transmission of offshore wind in um, you know, large quantities as well as upstate renewables and hydropower in order to get our grid to be cleaner. Um, we also have regular conversations with Con Edison about the upgrades that will be needed um, and then and EDC uh, and also the Navy Yard have been involved in NYSERDA's economic development solicitation um, and I'm sure EDC will provide more information uh, on that process as we go through Q&A. Um, how are we sort of looking at, um, what, what, do we have any idea what NYSERDA's criteria is to give to whom? So that's a great question. Again, there is a lot of modeling that is going on at the state level right now. So NYSERDA uh, held an all day conference yesterday um, on the needs for um, how we're gonna move, trans, you know, transmit this power both from offshore wind as well as around the state. Um, and I think there, there is a general understanding that the only way to get New York City's grid to be clean is a large influx of offshore wind, both to New York City and to Long Island, as well as bringing resources from upstate um, into the grid. So, you know, I, 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 while we use every opportunity through, you know, public service commission um, proceedings, as well as stakeholder involvement at the NISO to push for a large bulk power into New York City to be clean, um, again, I think that the studies are all aligning to show that that, that that is what needs to happen in order for the state to meet the CLCPA goals. 
Is the state thinking about trade-offs, right? If they give us one transmission line for hydropower, that means we don't get a transmission line for wind power. I mean, are, is this a zero-sum game where if we get one, we don't get the other? I mean, that, that's part of my concern here. Sure. Um, and of course, I can't speak for the state. Um, but what I can say is that, again, going back to uh, what was released yesterday, as well as what has been shown through studies at the NISO, um, it, uh, again, there's this recognition that in order to get to 100% clean electricity by 2040, we're going to need a lot of new transmission, both from offshore wind and from um, hydropower and, and renewable sources upstate. And how do we look at it as far as, you know, the, the cost of the installation and how is it going to translate to energy bills for consumers? Sure. So um, the first solic solicitations uh, that you were talking about earlier, the Sunrise um, and Empire Wind, the bids came in at about uh, $83 a megawatt hour. Um, so the cost is more than traditional power. However, the state has been looking at um, providing a system of um, OREC, so offshore wind renewable energy credits, and socializing that cost across the state. Um, so while I don't have on bill figures because it's too early to say that, um, we uh, are pleased that any additional cost for offshore wind will be um, a statewide um, socialization of that cost. We also expect that as the offshore wind and you know you, you saw some of the figures you quoted about how much offshore wind uh, can be built on the on the eastern seaboard, those costs are going to come down as they have in, in Europe. Um, all that tech, this technology is not nascent. Um, you know it is utilized widely um, in other places, and so we expect as future bids come in to the NYSERDA solicitations, they'll start to to drop. And there'll be less of a need to um, subsidize and socialize that across the state. Great. Um, I just want to quickly just kind of chime in here that we're joined by Councilmember Eric Ulrich of Queens as well for today's committee hearing. Um, so jobs and a just transition. Um, as we are sort of creating these you know, opportunities for installation, uh, what happens with how do we sort of make sure that New York City residents have access to these jobs? the training for these jobs, you know, these are um, presumably, I'm guessing, good, lay, you know, good, you know, middle class, you know, labor jobs, right, union jobs. Like, how do we make sure that we are training a workforce to get these jobs and that, you know, New York City is not going to be left out? So I'm going to turn this over to my colleague from EDC, Ense Athema. I think she's on mute. Uh, that's thank pretty you. Much Th thank you for that question, Chair. Um, so we do expect to see jobs in um, installation and maintenance, um, installation and staging, operations and maintenance, and in project development. And so you're right that definitely, especially the installation and staging jobs and the operations and maintenance jobs, those are going to be trade jobs, um, wind technicians, electricians, plumbers, mariners, um, and we are committed to ensuring that New York City residents can access those jobs. Our strategy at EDC is to leverage our port assets to ensure that New York City can become a hub for the industry and to also leverage those assets to ensure that we are securing various investments. We call it ecosystem investments around workforce development, growing and scaling the pipeline, um, uh, of, of New Yorkers who can enter those jobs. So are we, how are we sort of planning out that, that sort of, you know, sort of long-term goal? Right, so we are, um, as Suzanne mentioned, we are currently in some negotiations that allow us from going into a lot of depth here, Chair, but um, we are working on creating um, various programming, thinking about um, pre-apprenticeship programs, um, programs with uh, DOE, K-12 K um, programs that would be able to address various parts of that pipeline to be able to ensure that no matter where we are, um, where New Yorkers are on that, that um, path, they can secure jobs in the industry. 
So we're developing programmatic ideas right now. Okay. Um, I guess I'm, I'm, I have a couple of other questions. Uh, where do we sort of expect this to be plugged in? Like where, where, where are the utilities? You know, I, I'm a proponent of public power and I'm a little still uncomfortable with giving this to a private uh, uh, generator, you know, a, pri a private distributor, but that's, looks like the, the, the path that, that's being chosen by the state to give it to, you know, have kind of be the distributor. Where are this plugging in? How is this going to work? I know you had said you had had some conversations with them thus far. Um, how is this going to work, you know, with, with what sort of, what, what upgrades are, are they going to make? Are they willing to make them? Like, how is this all going to come together? Sure. Um, so our understanding is that Empire Wind is looking at the Gowanus substation um, as a, a location to interconnect. Um, again, at, at yesterday's um, conference, Con Edison presented their initial ideas around um, and space for where these interconnections would happen, um, mainly at, um, and I'm not sure whether or not Con Ed is testifying today, so um, you, could, you can get more details from them, but um, mostly they, in the presentation yesterday, uh, were looking at some of the coastal um, uh, substations, transmission level substations um, in Brooklyn and Queens um, and Manhattan. So, you know, again, these are very early studies. Um, and so, you know, this is a process that's ongoing at the state as part of their um, PSC mandated grid study. Uh, the utilities were required to submit their initial ideas um, and presented those yesterday. Um, we expect the state's remainder of the uh, study to come out in the coming weeks. Um, and then that'll be open for a comment process. And back to my you know, earlier statements in my testimony, you know, the city will certainly weigh in and provide feedback on, on those, uh, both where those connection points are and costs when they are available in those studies. So I guess the last question before I turned it over to my colleagues, um, you know, we have this great law, Local Law 97, um, that, you know, we are, we're encouraging buildings to make retrofits. We want those investments. We want buildings to think about things like electrification. You know, how do we sort of envision wind energy as a opportunity for us to green our grid? Like, what percentage of our grid do we sort of envision wind energy playing? How do we sort of see this as an opportunity to spur Local Law 97 and say, like, we have a cleaner grid, so you should go for electrification, right? Like, how do we sort of think about this in the larger context of decarbonizing our grid and, and spurring this investment that's also going to create good green jobs? Um, so what's our sort of thought process here around? Because this is going to come online right around the same time that the first grouping of buildings need to get done, right? So that's right. this all that's should right. be very synergistic, right? That's right. Um <laughs> So um, the advisory board that uh, Local Law 97 convened as part of the, what was in the local law has a group that's working on uh, what they call emission coefficient. So that means, you know, what is the mix of the grid at, by what date? Um, so certainly offshore wind, as I mentioned, even in the city's own modeling plays a role um, to change that coefficient to be um, a cleaner, you know, today we get a lot of our power from fossil fuels. Um, as we start to see these installations come online, that coefficient will get better and better. And, and as you said, you know, building owners can expect um, a better and better coefficient over time. An important caveat though, is that in local law 97, we, we fixed until 2030, we fixed the coefficient to a pre Indian point closure um, because we knew these resources, uh, these cleaner resources would take some time to come into the New York City grid. And therefore, we didn't want building owners to be penalized for the closure of Indian Point. Um, so until 2030, they have the coefficient um, that was established in the law. And then this advisory board will be looking to model what that coefficient should be like past 2030, uh, which will inevitably be cleaner as all these sources come in. Okay. So, I mean, so I guess I will 
now ask if any of my colleagues have any questions. And if not, then I'll come back for a few more and then we'll wrap up with the administration. Samara, is, or does any of my colleagues have any questions? I do not see anybody's hand up at the present time. Okay. All right. Um, so then I guess, I guess I'll ask a couple more questions and I'll let you guys off the hook and we'll move on to the next grouping. Um, what do we look at as battery storage? What role will battery storage play uh, in wind generation and is this part of the build outs that we're thinking about around Gowanus and, and the different parts of, of the city where we are going to plug in? That's a great question. And it battery storage will play a critical component to both uh, what we see as our, you know, our solar strategy as well as offshore wind. So both of those resources are intermittent. Um, and so we need both storage and other clean baseload resources to be able to provide power when either the wind isn't blowing or the sun's not shining. Um, the city has been working hard to um, make our permitting process more transparent to the um, storage developers. So we've issued both FDNY and DOB guidance, uh, which we think will move that industry faster. Um, and also Con Edison is currently in an open procurement for utility scale storage up to 300 megawatts. So while right now we have about 20 megawatts of storage throughout the city, um, we do anticipate that that will um, ramp up um, over the coming few years. And how close are we? I know we had done a bail around battery storage you know, back in the time before COVID, it feels like a lifetime ago. Um, but we did, did we did do a bill around battery storage, and we're and we're getting there, right? Like we we're, we're going to make it easier for everyone to access, right? Absolutely. Um, we are working towards um, procuring our long-term energy plan, which was also a, another bill that we have merged the battery storage in, so we can be looking holistically at how does the city and what levers does the city have in order to you know, make our clean energy future a reality? Um, that study is in its procurement process. Um, you know, there have, as you might imagine, there have been some delays due to COVID um, pause, but you know, we're, we're moving as aggressively as we can to launch that study, um, which will lay out you know, a vision for this bulk storage um, throughout the city. Uh, as as we need it um, to balance these intermittent resources. And who's going to be responsible for um, building the, you know, constructing and maintaining interconnecting power lines? Um, what role does the city have with that? Again, good jobs, right? Just asking, just wanted to sort of curious about that as well. Right. So, um, you know, the, the city... At, at, at this time will not be uh, responsible for maintaining transmission level power lines. Um, that is um, a combination of the transmission owners throughout the state. So um, the, the builder um, and the owner can, you know, can, can be the same or it can be the utility um, depending on where you are throughout the state. Um, so the, the main piece of this, though, is that um, we need to ensure that this transmission um, gets built and gets built quickly. Um, there, are, there is a process through the NISO, um, a competitive process. Um, there's also, you know, NYSERDA's offshore wind procurements, which, will, uh, which include transmission. Um, so, you know, the, the bottom line here is that um, the, the transmit, we need all of that transmission both from upstate to downstate and from, from the offshore wind. And you know, we need to utilize these state processes um, as quickly as possible in order to realize, realize that power to come into the city. All right, well, I'm excited about getting as much wind energy as we possibly can into New York City. I am definitely excited about the green jobs and the good union jobs that it will create. And I'm looking forward over the next 13 months because that's about how much time I have as a council member um, to continue these conversations with you um, to ensure that we're on the right track for 2024. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you.
thank you for your testimony today. And, and Samara, if you can bring on the next witnesses. Thank you very much for the administration. Take care. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sunan. Have a great holidays. You too. Stay safe. You as well. Thank you. Uh, we'll now turn to the public testimony. I would like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling people one by one to testify. Council members who have a question for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant of Arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. Again, for the wind energy producers, their testimony will be limited to 10 minutes. I would now like to welcome Julia Beauvais, who is representing Empire Wind to testify, followed by Ken Bowles, who is representing Eversource Energy Sunrise Wind. Starting time. Thank you very much for the opportunity to discuss with you Equinor's plans for developing offshore wind to serve New York and particularly New York City with renewable energy. My name is Julia Bovey. I'm the Director of External Affairs at Equinor Wind US. Our responsibilities include making sure that our plans in New York are developed in collaboration with New Yorkers and that we respond to and incorporate stakeholder feedback as we design, engineer, and build our offshore wind projects for New York. Now I've submitted four pages of written testimony, but I'll hit just the highlights in my, in my oral testimony and keep my eye on the clock here. Just a little bit about me. I first moved to New York City in the 1980s to attend college here. And I've now raised two sons who call themselves New Yorkers. I'd like to think I've been here long enough to act like a New Yorker, but also to understand and appreciate the city and its people as an outsider who had to learn the ropes the hard way. This experience, plus a long career in renewable energy, is great preparation for someone helping to build the first offshore wind project to power New York City. You know, as they say, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. But we at Equinor know that sometimes the opposite can be true. You know, that if just because you can make it other places doesn't necessarily mean you can make it here. And what what is sort of the make or break on that? How do you make it in New York? Well, I think we can all agree that it's by working together with the folks that have for many years, certainly before Equinor came to town, decided that offshore wind energy had to be a big part of the energy mix here in order to meet our shared climate goals, to put New Yorkers to work. And Equinor knows that our opportunity here is the result of hard work by hundreds of New Yorkers who have advocated for offshore wind. We know that good policy in New York created an attractive market and that's what's brought developers like Equinor here. We're working with the people and organizations who put these market shape shaping policies in place. And we know that's the key to our success. So just a little bit about Equinor by way of background, Equinor built its first offshore wind project in 2009. Since then we've built offshore wind farms in the UK and that's where we're currently constructing the world's largest offshore wind farm. We've also built offshore wind farms in other parts of Europe and we're currently developing offshore wind in Asia and in South America. By 2026, Equinor expects to increase our global installed capacity of renewable energy by 10x, and that's an annual growth rate of more than 30%. And just this fall, Equinor announced our goal to become a net zero ener uh, energy company by 2050. I also want to make one more note of uh, recent news about Equinor. We entered into a strategic partnership with BP. They'll become a 50% non-operating partner in Empire Wind and Beacon Wind. And that transaction is expected to close early next year. So on to Empire Wind, uh, the chair uh, gave a little bit of detail about the project. Indeed, it's about 15 miles south of Jones Beach. Uh, the project won um, that le its lease area in a federal wind auction um, at the end of 2016. We got to work at that point on engineering studies and research. And as a result of that work, we bid in and won an 800 megawatt project in that first New York State procurement. I know that uh, the chair is interested in the interconnection plans for the project. Uh, our plan is to interconnect Empire Wind into a substation that is called the Gowana substation, but it's actually in Sunset Park, Brooklyn. It's a great place to interconnect wind because there's room on the grid there 
and it's also very, uh, very close to the waterline as well. At the same time, we're developing a second project for New York called Empire Wind 2. We've entered that proposal into the current NYSERDA to offshore wind procurement that mentioned, and we're awaiting word from New York State on the results of that procurement. And we have a second federal offshore wind lease area that's 60 miles off of Montauk. We call that Beacon Wind. And we've also entered a project from Beacon Wind into the current New York State uh, offshore wind procurement. And for Beacon Wind, we've proposed interconnecting the power um, into the New York electric grid in Western Queens. Uh, in, actually, it's in the Chairs District. Uh, this is an ideal location for an ejection of offshore wind energy because Western Queens was once home to four major power plants making electricity for much of New York City. So the wires are, are already in place to distribute power from that part of Western Queens. So again, that proposal has been submitted to the state and Equinor has to win a competitive process and sign a contract uh, before any of those plans can move forward. Now the question, how are we gonna make all this happen? How are we gonna build these projects? Well, when I joined Equinor, I joined a team that's made up of some of the most experienced technical engineers and scientists from all over the world working on offshore wind. And what was the first question they asked when they came to New York? What, they asked what port in New York is most capable of hosting the construction of a massive offshore wind energy project like Empire Wind? Talking about a port with 100 acres of space, uh, with waterside wharves that can hold 6,000 ton components and has uh, areas of deep water right next to the Keystone. Well, as we all know, uh, the answer is there isn't a port like that in New York. So another company might have moved immediately to the option of building their project in another state. But Equinor has always recognized that the local investment and local jobs are the main driver, or one of the main drivers of New York's offshore wind goals. So we set out to find a port in New York that could be reconstructed and upgraded for the assembly of Empire Wind. And one of the things we learned quickly is that such an undertaking is so massive that we needed to find a way to build a port, not just for Empire Wind, but to serve all New York offshore wind projects that want to construct here for decades to come. And like all other big shared infrastructure projects, a port like this can't be built with private money alone. It needs public investment. Building an offshore wind supply chain in New York must be a collective effort by developers, commercial suppliers of all sizes, policymakers at every level of government, communities, and advocates. Now remember, each state on the East Coast that has procured offshore wind is competing to locate the supply chain in their state because they know, just as we do, that the first assembly ports will be the catalyst for other parts of the supply chain to set up shop nearby, bringing more jobs and investment with them. And that brings us to the issue of the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal, or you know, as we call it, SBMT. You'll hear from others today about the potential for SBMT to be the center of the offshore wind supply chain uh, in New York and for the region. And there are better people than I to outline the vision, commitment, risk, and gumption it's taken over many years to get SBMT to where it is today, which is the most promising and essential first step to locating the offshore wind supply chain here. But suffice to say, when Equinor identified SBMT as the key to our ability to assemble Empire Wind in New York, we found the only reason SBMT is available today is because of the community who has fought for decades to preserve the space for marine industry to once again thrive in Brooklyn. And when I say community, I mean not only Sunset Park, but also the city that owns the port, the agency, EDC that manages it, and the partnership that operates it as well. So here's the status of SBMT for Equinor. Together with the port's operators and owners, Equinor submitted a proposal to New York State to turn SBMT into a world-class offshore wind port capable of staging and assembling the largest, most sophisticated offshore wind technology and components and becoming the operations and maintenance base for offshore wind projects throughout the region. Now, this is a competitive process and New York State is allocating up to $200 million in matching funds toward the port improvements that are needed and competition is stiff. The Equinor SBMT proposal leverages significant private investment from Equinor and our partners with money already committed by New York City in this request for state investment. And again, SBMT would be the largest dedicated offshore wind port facility in the United States currently, 
And it is the only available industrial waterfront site in the New York City area capable of doing this job. Equinor is grateful for the support of all who have worked with us on the shared vision. And now we await New York State's decision on its current offshore wind procurement and how it will allocate those very important port improvement funds. And we appreciate the committee's interest in offshore wind development. Looking forward to working with you and answering your questions. Thank you, Julia. I appreciate that. And uh, I have just a number of questions. Um, if this pro if SBMT does come to fruition, if we're able to get all the approvals from the state, when do you believe it'll be operational? Well, there's a lot that has to happen between then and now, um, but we believe that it could be operational mid 2020s. So we would probably say 24. But 24. we okay. have to recognize that that uh, you know the permitting itself is is a big undertaking. It's, you know, it's not something we can't all accomplish together. But permitting first, then construction. All right. How do we envision how many jobs uh, will your project create? So we're conservative and we and we only like to count our direct jobs. And so lots of economists will tell you about the second order effects and and uh, other jobs that will be located as a result. But we say three to five hundred direct jobs at SBMT, unique jobs. How many jobs is that? Say that again. I'm sorry. I, I... Three to five hundred. And 500. then you add to that suppliers. Um, vessel operators um, and, the, and those second order effects that will be um, catalyzed by those three to five. How many, how many of those jobs will be from New, from New York City residents and, and from environmental justice communities? Sure. Um, you know, as Ansay said, New York is in a, New York City's in a unique position because it owns the port. It can use that leverage to, um, to really uh, set expectations clearly. Uh, we know as a potential user of this port, if it's funded, um, that we will commit to working uh, with EDC and, and through them Workforce One, the New York City Employment <laughs> Agency, <laughs> to make sure that, that we hire through New York, through Workforce One to get, uh, to get workers from disadvantaged communities, primarily Sunset Park, but also other communities around there. And if we're lucky enough to win Beacon Wind, and we're interconnecting in Western Queens, then we would focus on those communities as well to get the jobs at SPMT. Well, I am very excited about the both projects. Um, Beacon Wind, I am very, very interested in. Um, you know already, this Astoria has provided 55% of the city's power for decades. And it's all been dirty fossil fuel infrastructure in our community. There's come a cost with that, right? There's you know, higher asthma rates. We have our own version of Asthma Alley in Western Queens. I would love to replace uh, those fossil fuel plants because we went from having the most dirty power plant in New York State and the Paletti plant that closed down to having the next dirtiest power plant in New York State, which was Ravenswood. Um, I'm tired of holding that title. I'd rather have the title of uh, most clean energy um, so if we're able to do Beacon Wind, we're able to do Renewable Rikers, you know, connecting those together with, you know, utility scale battery storage could really be a boon for the city and a job creator and really give us an opportunity to create renewable energy in a, in a large way and, and replace dirty fossil fuel infrastructure and put it out the pasture. Uh, I, I think that's, that's a vision we all share, right? <laughs> I know you can't talk too much about uh, Beacon Wind, but I can say how much I support it. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that support. Uh, and I've let the state know that, just <laughs> so you know. I'm not shy. Um, what's the, just really quickly, um, what do you see as like, the life cycle of a wind turbine? Sure. Well, we... We, have, we look at the life cycle of the machines and, and the foundations and also the contract that we have for uh, the length of the lease area. Um, so these are all different things that could limit or extend the life of the project. Uh, we think that we, we like to think the machines would last 25 years. Other wind, uh, wind machines around the world have lasted a lot longer, but what ha has also been the case is that wind turbines have become more and more efficient 
over the years. And it's almost like when you buy a, a laptop computer, you know, a year later, they're twice as efficient. And so what we do see is lots of developers choose to replace the turbines before what they thought was the end of the useful life because they can generate so much more electricity with new models. We'll try to control for that by making sure that we install the absolute um, newest state-of-the-art and most efficient wind turbines and, and plan to get you know, 25, 30 years out of them, uh, at which point we'd need to extend our federal lease. We also plan to install foundations in the lease area that ideally will be able to hold whatever wind turbines uh, we might see in 30 years. Of course, that's hard to to imagine, but um, the idea is that we'll have foundations that are very robust. And what happens when it decommissioned, right? Like what, what happens to a turbine? Like what, where does it go? How does it move? Mm -hmm. What is the impact of both the installation and the removal on the ecosystems out in the ocean as well? Like how does this all work? Sure. Uh, installing, installing the turbines uh, means first installing foundations to hold them. And then, uh, and then fitting the, the tower section into the foundation so that it stands up. There's a few different types of offshore wind foundations. The type that, that Empire Wind intends to use as much as possible is called a gravity-based foundation. It has the lowest environmental impact because it avoids pile driving, which is, uh, can cause uh, painful noise to marine mammals in some cases if it's not, if the noise isn't controlled properly. Um, so to the full extent feasible, we intend to use these gravity-based foundations. And an added bonus for those is that they can be made in New York. So that's a huge amount of, of New York content. Um, the process then, once those are uh, installed in the lease area, as I said, bringing the, the tower and wind turbine sections, which will be assembled at SBMT, out to the lease area where a large vessel will take them off the barges and, and put them in the foundations. Now, decommissioning 30 years from now or uh, more, uh, there are a lot of work streams happening now, both at Equinor, but across the industry in several parts of the world, really looking at the potential for recycling the materials that are in um, the blades. The blades are, uh, are a composite uh, carbon fiber composite. And so there, there does need to be a lot more work on recycling those, but parts of the, that, of the components that are steel and, and concrete, those are, those are recycled. Okay, Costa. He looks like he might be frozen. Okay. All right, uh, sorry about that. Um, you know, uh, do we see any, um, any of my colleagues with their hand up? Uh, none, none at the present time. And Julia, last question I have, what, is, uh, what are your thoughts about working with the surrounding communities uh, for economic development, for sort of that you're not just doing this, but that you're part of the larger community in the long term? Sure. Well, I think that the um, CLPCA sets, you know, sort of a great framework for that, uh, for any companies coming into New York to understand that at least 40% of the investments need to be made in disadvantaged communities. And for us, those mean, that means long-term relationships. So it means, um, opening an office and having that office in Brooklyn it, at, near SBMT if we're lucky enough to, to win the funding there. Um, it means making sure that the community has access to learn about offshore wind, to understand the, the workforce readiness that's needed, that we are working extra hard to make sure that we're hiring from, from within the community and that, we're, and that we're spending our dollars in the community. Um, and, you know, again, EDC, is a great partner on that. They've been phenomenal. But also the community activists that have worked for years to, to preserve the, the working waterfront, you know, they have also been quite an amazing resource for us to be able to you know, figure out what's worked in their community in the past and what hasn't according to them. Um, they have often given us the example of Sims Recycling Facility as a great example of a company that's able to come in and work and be successful 
on the Brooklyn waterfront in a way um, that uh, that is in great cooperation with the community. So that's the kind of model that that we that we want to emulate. Okay, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that Uprose and Mija have been in close contact with you and and begun these conversations of ensuring just transitions and good working jobs, right? Absolutely, I mean, they they have been phenomenal and uh, really had their door open uh, to us from day one. And you know, this is this is their vision at the end of the day for what uh, what they wanted in their community all along. I mean, as I said, it's no accident that this space is there, ready ready for marine industry to resume. It's been protected by the community because that's what they want there. And uh, we feel lucky to come into a situation like that. All right, so at this at this time, actually, uh, Councilmember Menchaca does have some questions, so I'll pass it over to Thank him. You. Thank you. Starting time. Hello. I don't know what's going on with my video here. Okay. Chair, can you hear me? Yes. Hear you, Carlos. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. I, I don't know why my video isn't on. It was on earlier. Um, I just want to um, kind of go back to, to Julia. Thank you for being here and, and kind of speaking to, uh, we, we've spoken before uh, in the community. And I just want to reiterate the, the historical nature of this, of this unprecedented opportunity that the real driver here has always been the community of Sunset Park and that it's taken the city agency some time and, and, and I'll even say the state some time to get on board. Um, and so I, I think it's important that, that we just state that for the record here for this committee and for the council members that are listening and anyone who's here, that it's, it's been the community of Sunset Park and the incredible advocacy and the vision to really set SBMT, the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal into motion. Uh, there were a couple moments that were difficult for the community in, in fights with the city that were kind of oriented in another way. I think we fixed that, uh, but I just, I just wanna keep coming back to that. There's, th th there's no way that this would have been possible without Sunset Park thinking about this, advocating, building power um, and executing. And so I just wanna remind everyone of that. And the reason I'm reminding everyone of that is because there are some troubled waters as we move forward to get this stuff going. And, and we're gonna always go back to the community. The community will lead us in that direction as we, as we really lay out the infrastructure, get SBMT up and running uh, and really welcome this new infrastructure. So thank you, thank you for being here. Um, and I just needed to say uh, and put that on the record. Thank you, Chair. So much, Councilmember Menchaca, for your questions and statement. Um, Julia, thank you, and I look forward to working with you on SBMT and hopefully Beacon as well. Um, so thank you for your time, and I wish you a very happy holiday. Thank you very much on behalf of everyone at Equinor. We're so thrilled to be able to talk about this with you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And now I would like to welcome Ken Bowles to testify, followed by Summer Sandoval of Uprose and the Peak Coalition. It's Ken Bowles here. Okay. We can always come back to Ken Bowles. I believe he's in the attendees. Okay, then we will have some of Can you hear me now? Ken uh, Bowles? Can you hear me now? Uh, yes, I can hear you. <clears throat> Great, thank you. Uh, chairman, council members, and invited guests, uh, thank you for the invitation to speak today regarding Sunrise Wind. My name is Ken Bowes. I'm the Vice President of Offshore Wind, Siting and Permitting for Eversource Energy. I've shared a presentation with you today and I'll identify the slides as I go through them. So I'm going to slide two, uh, just a little bit about uh, Sunrise Wind. 
It's a, it's a joint venture of Orsted and Eversource. It's a 50, 50 uh, partnership, which means we share in the risks and the rewards for the sunrise wind project. We believe we bring unparalleled experience to the New York market. Moving on to slide three. On the left-hand slide, you'll see a corporate profile of Orsted and on the right-hand side of Eversource. First, starting with Orsted. Orsted ranks number one in the Corporate Knights 2020 Index of the Global 100 Most Sustainable Companies. They have the most experience in offshore wind industry, commissioning their first offshore wind project in 1991. In 2017 into 2018, that first offshore wind firm was decommissioned. I know there was a question about that recently. So what happened with those decommissioned materials? First of all, we excavated 15 feet below the seabed floor and removed the foundation. All of the secondary steel, the primary steel, copper from the cables and wiring has been recycled. The turbine blades now serve as noise barriers along highways in Denmark. In all, most all of the materials for the project have been recycled for future use and some in novel and unique ways. Orsted also is the owner and operator of the first offshore wind farm in the US, the Block Island Wind Farm, and just recently commissioned the second offshore wind farm for Dominion Energy in Virginia. In total, they have 26 wind farms worldwide with more than 1,500 turbines in operation. On the right-hand side, a little bit about Eversource. Eversource has been ranked the number one most just utility by Forbes and Just Capital. We also rank number one in the country in energy efficiency. We're a national leader in, in transmission. In fact, today, we own and operate seven interties with the state of New York. And on an hourly basis, power flows to and from New York, from New England, as the needs arise. We also serve more than 4.3 million customers in New England, serving them with electric, water, and gas services. We understand what it means to be the local provider in more than 500 communities in New England. And collectively, we think there's a, a bright future ahead for clean energy. In fact, we've announced the first utility in the country that will be carbon neutral by 2030. Moving on to more details about the Sunrise project itself. I'm now gonna jump over onto slide six. The wind turbines for Sunrise Wind will be located 30 miles east of the South Fork off Montauk Point. In general, barely visible from anyone in, in the New York area. The electricity generated will be transmitted more than 100 miles to Smith Point um, in, as the interconnection point or the landfall location. And from there, 17 miles uh, through the county, state, and town roads in Brookhaven, uh, Brookhaven, New York. This point of interconnection was chosen after a careful study of more than 20 substations in New York. And a little bit different than other power purchase agreements, we actually will sell our power into the open market on a daily basis and collect OREC revenues, as was mentioned previously, ocean renewable energy credits as the subsidy portion of the project. So by selecting a project with high nodal prices, that minimizes the ratepayer impact based upon the Sunrise Wind location. All of the project will be buried underground both for the offshore as well as the onshore. Moving on to slide seven, some of the benefits directly, obviously no harmful emissions for cleaner air, reduce the carbon intensive resources and create jobs. In total, 800 direct jobs and 1,500 to 2,000 indirect jobs. In fact, we already have more than 100 employees in the state of New York working on this project. Moving on to slide eight, this will be offsetting about uh, 230,000 cars per year, taking off the road with more than 2.1 metric tons of carbon dioxide removed. Awesome. Moving on to slide nine, some of the economic benefits. Uh, aside from the direct and indirect jobs it will provide, we also, also will have a host community agreement with the town of Brookhaven. We also have a, another uh, 
project component in the town, and that's the Port Jefferson Operations and Maintenance Facility, which I'll speak of in a few slides. Sunrise has committed more than $10 million to seed fund the National Offshore Wind Training Center in Suffolk County. And we have partners in the labor, academic, and environmental community. And this will serve as, as a nationwide location to train the next generation of utility and offshore wind workers. Sunrise Wind is also committed to performing secondary steel fabrication in the New York capital region, the Port of Albany. We recently signed a national offshore wind labor agreement with the building trades. Moving on to slide um, 10, which is the Port Jefferson. One of the largest commitments we've made to New York is at the, the Port Jefferson uh, facility. We've committed to having our operations hub here for the entire Northeast region, which will include 100 permanent jobs, including the location of our service operation vessel. We recently announced the first Jones Act compliant US built service operation vessel. In essence, it's the floating hotel for our workers to be uh, servicing the wind farms from. We've also made commitments to the, the port of Port Jefferson for infrastructure improvements to accommodate the new service operation vessel. Now I'm gonna to jump towards the stakeholder outreach, which is actually slide 13. From our team, consistent ongoing stakeholder engagement is a core value and critical part of the development and construction process. For example, for the Sunrise Wind Project, we had our open house last week for the project. And in that we indicated we've had more than 100 meetings with local public officials and stakeholder groups. For this now, I'm gonna go on to, to slide 16, just kind of a summary slide. Uh, again, we'll provide power to more than 500,000 New York homes with clean renewable energy, provide ongoing jobs, our, our operations and maintenance facility at Port Jefferson, and during construction, 800 direct jobs and almost 2,000 indirect jobs. And we look forward to building and operating the Sunrise Wind Project for the next 20 plus years. Thank you very much. Oh, well, thank you for your testimony. Uh, so when do you believe your project will be operational? And, and I'll ask you the same questions I, I asked the Beckham. So for the Sunrise One project, well, we're anticipating 2024 into 2025 for full operation. And you talked about you know, several, how we talk, 800 jobs. Is that, that the correct number that you're, you're, first, you're, you're seeing that you're working with the building trades and so on? Is that correct? 800 direct jobs, yes, that we're working directly on the project. And that's, you said you would sign an agreement, you'd work, you're working with the building trades to make sure they're good union jobs? That is correct. And we will have a project specific labor agreement for the Sunrise Wind Project, as with all of our other projects, South Fork, Revolution, and possibly even Sunrise too, if we're selected in this next round with my survey. And what's been your community engagement? You have, just we can go back to that as well. Hello? Ken, Ken did I lose you? Hello? I don't see him. Hello? I, th I think we lost him. Ken, are you still there? Hello? Uh, I guess scenario, I guess we'll, we'll go forward. I guess if I, I, I'll forego any other questions I have and I'll, I'll put his testimony to the record. 
Okay. All right. Um, I will now call on Sem Summer Sandoval of Uprose and of the Peak Coalition, and then she will be followed by Carlos Garcia of Nija. Summer? Starting time. Can you hear me? Yes. So good afternoon, committee chair and city council, and thank you for the opportunity to submit testimony today. My name is Summer Sandoval, and I am the Energy Democracy Coordinator at UPROSE. And today I'm here on behalf and alongside with members of the PEAK Coalition. PEAK is a coalition of five groups that includes UPROSE, the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, the Point CDC, New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, and Clean Energy Group. We are committed to creating a comprehensive effort to replace New York City's peak bear power plants that disproportionately harm and pollute environmental justice communities with renewable energy and energy storage alternatives such as offshore wind to achieve a just transition. <clears throat> In the midst of multiple crises, it is crucial for New York City to address the root of inequities in our fossil fuel dependent energy systems. Crises are not exclusive and decades of decisions that place these clusters of polluting infrastructure in communities of color and low income communities have exacerbated public health impacts from both COVID-19 as well as climate change hazards. Offshore wind development is an opportunity to work with frontline community leadership to create thousands of well-paid climate jobs, increase local clean energy resources and help New York meet emission reduction and equity mandates codified by the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. Studies show that the CLCPA will create up to 150,000 jobs over the next 10 years. These jobs will be in renewable energy development, energy efficiency, retrofit, construction, <clears throat> manufacturing, and supporting indirect industries. In order to ensure local job creation, New York must invest in the necessary infrastructure to host these jobs. Increasing increasing in-city renewable energy generation and meeting New York's goal of 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind by 2035 is an integral step to replace old polluting peaker plants. But offshore wind development must be approached in a comprehensive manner with frontline community leadership at the forefront of priorities, decision-making and implementation. So we urge the New York City Council to support a comprehensive model of offshore wind development and investments in New York City. Offshore wind developers must be required to work alongside communities to create workforce training programs and resources that ensure new clean energy jobs are accessible and that long-term benefits are realized by local residents. I'd like to thank the New York City Council for holding this hearing today and for the opportunity to testify. And for more information, please visit our coalition website at peakcoalition.org. Thank you. Summer, thank you for all the great work that you guys do on uh, advocating for your community and every community that has been burdened by these fossil fuel plants for generations. I remember the power now. I wasn't a council member. I was in college when they decided that they were going to place these plants uh, back in the early 2000s with the, you know, with the stipulation that it would be open for only three years. Um, it's now 20 years later, and those peaker plants are still in our neighborhoods. In Queens, I know they're right next to the Queensbridge, Ravenswood, and Astoria houses. Um, so thank you for your advocacy to fight back against these peaker plants in uh, EJ communities. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Summer. And next we will have Carlos Garcia of Nija to testify. Starting time. Uh, good afternoon, Chairperson Constantinides and members Levin, Menchaca, Ulrich, and Yeager. My name is Carlos Garcia, and on behalf of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance, NIJA, I'm here to testify in support of the continued development of offshore wind in and around New York City. Founded in 1991, NIJA is a nonprofit citywide membership network linking 11 grassroots organizations from low income neighborhoods and communities of color in the struggle for environmental justice. NIJA has a long history in the fight for the development of renewable energy in New York City and throughout the state. From its instrumental role in the passing of the state's Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, CLCPA, to our most recent efforts in providing technical expertise to the Peak Coalition, 
Nija has always prioritized New York's fight for environmental justice over expediency or the easy route. <clears throat> Looking at the role continued uh, offshore wind development will have in New York's energy sector, its positive community externalities reveal a win-win for New York's fight for environmental justice and resiliency. From an electrical grid standpoint, the interconnection of offshore wind and Sunset Park and other EJ communities throughout New York will provide a vital supply of energy to offset the projected increased energy load that will offset the need for peaker power plants. A real world example of this is currently under consideration in Brooklyn. Like most of uh, the environmental justice communities in New York City, Sunset Park is considered a load pocket. A load pocket is an area where there is insufficient transmission capacity to reliably supply 100% of the electricity load. Load, you can, uh, you can think of it as how much the area is asking, how much the area is using without relying on generation capacity that is physically located within that area. According to the New York Independent System Operators, uh, NISO, newly released Reliability Needs Assessment Report, released just six days ago, the Astoria East Corona 130 kV and Greenwood Fox Hill 138 kV transmission load areas, which feed in and out of Sunset Park, are expected to see an energy deficiency of over 10 hours, totaling 659 megawatt hours on a peak day in 2023, and an energy efficiency of over 14 hours, totaling 3,571 megawatt hours over a 14 hour period on a peak day in 2025, respectively. Simply put, the NISO believes that there is not enough energy to meet the ever increasing demand for energy in South Brooklyn. Combine this with the aggressive electrification and electric vehicle targets New York City has committed to, New York City may face a larger problem than anticipated. While Nija and our allies have identified this problem and are working on amazing um, numerous novel solutions to this problem, partnerships uh, with uh, NIPA and uh, NYSERDA alike, the unique building typology and ownership structures of Brooklyn only compounds the difficulty of developing in-city renewable energy generation with a load pocket. This is where offshore wind comprises of a very unique and invaluable characteristic. Its ability to interconnect massive amounts of energy I'm inspired into energy efficient areas. Need to look forward to continued collaborations with the city, state, and energy advocates in our fight and for a cleaner, more equitable, just transition. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your testimony today. And thank you for all the work that you're doing on behalf of everyone here in New York City. And please give my best to Eddie. Thank you, Chairman. Looking forward to working with you more in the future as well. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Thank you, Carlos. And now I would like to Welcome Justin Wood of New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, who will be followed by Frank Acosta of ILA Local 1814. Starting time. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson Constantinides and members of the council. My name is Justin Wood and I'm the Director of Organizing and Research at New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. Thanks for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, NILPI and our partners in the Peak Coalition believe the rapid development of offshore wind farms and the corresponding onshore infrastructure should be a top priority for clean energy and job creation in the city. Uh, as we've heard, these investments in offshore wind plus local solar and battery storage, we can quickly move to decommission the polluting and expensive fossil fuel peaker plants, which perversely run on the hottest days when air quality is at its worst. As utility rate payers, New Yorkers have paid a staggering $4.5 billion over the past 10 years just to keep these inefficient and polluting peaker plants on standby. And most of this local money then goes to wealthy out-of-state corporations and private equity investors who own these plants. These funds would be far better spent building offshore wind, solar, and battery infrastructure to ensure a clean and reliable power supply in every community while targeting green jobs and workforce developments to the communities that need them most. As we've heard, the substations and turbine assembly sites needed for offshore wind can be a source of both green energy and desperately needed jobs in low-income communities and communities of color that are experiencing a devastating and multifaceted crisis this year. These communities have endured some of the highest COVID-19 infection and fatality rates in the nation they're disproportionately suffering from mass unemployment in the ongoing economic crisis, and they face long-term environmental burdens from air pollution 
that are now known to increase the severity of COVID-19 and other respiratory illnesses. We also know all too well that these same communities are on the front lines of climate crisis and will continue to face flooding, extreme heat, and extreme weather events in New York City. As you'll also hear from our partners in the Climate Works for All Coalition, offshore wind can be a powerful source of good, green, and living wage jobs in our working waterfront communities. And as we've heard specifically today, the Equinor project in Sunset Park alone could create hundreds of direct jobs plus additional indirect jobs for suppliers and contractors. We really look forward to working with the council and continuing to work with the administration, our state legislators and state agencies to ensure that New York State's clean energy transition is rapid and that it brings investments to our city's working waterfront and environmental justice communities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony today. Uh, next, we will have um, we will have Frank Acosta. Is Frank Acosta here? Okay. If Frank Acosta is not here, next we will move on to Carlos Castel Croc from uh, from the um, League of Conservation Voters. Carlos. Starting time. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Carlos Castel Croak, and I am the associate for New York City program at the New York League of Conservation Voters. Um, NYLCV represents over 30,000 members in New York City, and we are committed to advancing a sustainability agenda that will make our people, our neighborhoods, and our economy healthier and more resilient. I'd like to thank uh, Chair Constantinides for holding this hearing today and for the opportunity to testify. New York State and New York City um, in the past few years have made significant commitments to reducing fossil fuel emissions and fighting climate change. The Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, Climate Mobilization Act, and 1NYC 2050 are all groundbreaking commitments to sustainability that are leading us in the right direc direction towards a clean energy economy. In order to achieve these goals, we must meet the CLCPA's goal of building nine gigawatts of offshore wind by 2035. Much of the procurement and policy needed to advance offshore wind is happening at the state level, but there are still actions that New York City can take to ensure that the transition is to sustainable offshore wind uh, energy is cost effective, competitive, and well executed. First, the city must work with offshore wind developers and utilities to establish an efficient and effective way to connect to the grid. Coordination of siting transmission lines, interconnections, and infrastructure will be, comp will be a complex process that involves multiple jurisdictions and communities. We will need the city's help to make sure that these transi transition projects are sited and built efficiently, including making sure that we have enough appropriately zoned sites reserved for interconnection. Second, the city will also play an instrumental role in establishing and developing offshore wind industrial ports, ports such as those proposed at the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal and the Arthur Kill Terminal will need significant investments so they can facilitate and be involved in construction installation projects and associated supply chains. These ports will create jobs as the city recovers from the pandemic, providing a much needed boost to our economy. New York City has allocated some investments to port development, but we would like to see even more to help projects grow faster. In addition to developing the port infrastructure necessary for offshore wind, the city should also be connecting environmental justice communities to job training and placement with offshore wind companies, many of whom have shown a willingness to do their part to achieve climate justice. A just transition requires that we make sure that New Yorkers who have been most harmed by reliance on fossil fuels will also benefit from the green economy. Additionally, attention should be given to retaining workers previously employed by fossil fuel related industries and tapping those for these new green jobs. Third, uh, numerous permits and reviews will be necessary for construction of facilities to support development of offshore wind industry. The city must ensure that permitting to facilitate bringing offshore wind and associated supply and assembly work to New York is done as quickly as possible while also providing appropriate environmental reviews and community input. We are on the precipice of a shift to clean energy economy, a shift New York must be at the front of, a shift that will rely he heavily on offshore wind, in particular in New York City, to fight climate change, reduce resilience, um, on polluting power sources and ensure a time just expired. Transition. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you. And next we will have testimony from Shay O'Reilly of the of the 
Um, Sierra Club. Starting time. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Shay O'Reilly, and I'm an organizer for the Sierra Club's Beyond Coal campaign. For four years now, I have been organizing with our grassroots members and partners to support responsible offshore wind development. That first winter in 2016, we secured a 2,400 megawatt target by demonstrating that New Yorkers were ready to fight climate change and create tens of thousands of good jobs through nurturing an offshore wind industry. Now, just four years later, we have a state target of 9,000 megawatts by 2035, and we're doing it right. Led by the labor movement and frontline partners, we have secured responsible contracting standards in New York that are a model for the entire renewable industry. Offshore wind developers are required to pay prevailing wage, to enter into good faith negotiations towards a project labor agreement, and to abide by strict environmental standards. You'll hear from others today that these developers are working with community groups and labor unions to maximize benefits to local communities. Our city's energy is the dirtiest in the state with 90% of our power coming from gas and oil, and our density means limited opportunities to meet the high demand. Offshore wind with its high capacity factor and peak coincidence is one of the best solutions to this problem. It also provides a rare opportunity to significantly reindustrialize our city. Unlike Canadian hydropower, offshore wind investments create local and sustained jobs with the increasing viability of supply chain manufacturing locally as the industry scales up. It also adds incremental new clean energy to the region. We are at a critical juncture in the fight against climate change. In Astoria and Sunset Park, Private fossil fuel companies are attempting to extend the life of their aging gas plants by promoting theoretical hydrogen conversions that would still allow decades of pollution. We need every level of government to be clear that we will not allow new fossil fuel plants to be built. If you find yourself in a hole, you don't dig slower, you stop digging. Offshore wind combined with battery storage at these critical places can render fossil fuel plants obsolete while ensuring reliability and providing community investment. With your support, we can secure this local just transition. We are committed to seeing offshore wind flourish in New York and grateful for Minnesota's leadership. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and thank you to Council Member Cone saint for your unwavering commitment to climate action in our city. Thank you, Shay. Always good to see you. Thank you for your testimony today. Next, we will hear from Karen Imus of the Waterfront Alliance. Karen? Starting time. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my name is Karen Imus. I'm the Vice President of Programs at Waterfront Alliance. We're a nonprofit civic organization and coalition of more than 1,100 alliance partners, ranging from environmental advocates to educational institutions to businesses and corporations. We're here today to champion support for the growth of the offshore wind sector. For New York to achieve a major share of the jobs and economic benefits generated by serving as an offshore wind hub, the city and state must commit to the essential role that our ports, our maritime ports play to meet the needs of the offshore wind industry. Despite our region's extraordinary maritime history and capacity to support major renewable energy goals, the current state of our local ports and industrial waterfront infrastructure is not always well understood. Local maritime infrastructure must be a bigger policy and funding priority for the council and the mayor and the state if offshore wind can truly take off and be an economic engine for the region. Given the unique technical requirements for offshore wind component staging, handling, assembly, and installation, the industry requires port facilities that can handle heavy and large components while also providing unfettered and deep water access for the specialized installation vessels needed to install and maintain them, not to mention air draft restrictions at our local bridges. Many of the smaller ports in our region were not designed to accommodate these uh, constraints. However, these challenges can be overcome with a commitment to capital investment in infrastructure, retrofits, dredging, and other physical site upgrades. We encourage the city to include capital commitments in future budgets. With these upgrades, the 73-acre South Brooklyn Marine Terminal, for example, provides a tremendous opportunity to become an offshore wind hub and major economic driver for the city. Ultimately, the success of offshore wind will require a cooperative approach among owners and operators of various ports and the project developers, along with partnership with the city and state. Importantly, design considerations that promote climate adaptation and resiliency of the port in responding to such threats as sea level rise and dynamic flooding events will also be critical in these upgrades. With respect to workforce development opportunities, the city can play an important role in creating pathways of opportunity. While New York City has a highly skilled and well-trained workforce, gaps do exist in key skills required for this transition. 
Offshore wind roles are extremely varied given that the life cycle of a wind farm progresses from installation to decommissioning. This requires electricians, engineers, pipe fitters, wind technicians, as well as dozens of other occupations, not to mention traditional working waterfront occupations such as captains, crews, stevedores, and dry dock workers. In fact, 74 different professions are needed to build an offshore wind farm according to the Workforce Development Institute. We will need undergraduate and graduate programs that equip students with both hands-on experiences as well as research and development opportunities. And the cultivation of these skill sets begins even earlier through middle and high school. We will need programs the DOE, the CUNY system, and the SUNY system I'm to excited. build and train the workforce. Waterfront Alliance looks forward to collaborating with all the various actors and ensuring that we build the 21st century port infrastructure core to offshore wind success. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. It was good to see you. Thank you for your testimony today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Karen. And next we will have testimony from Professor Rodberg, who is Len Rodberg, the co-director of Community Studies of New York. Professor Rodberg, please. Starting time. <clears throat> I thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, I'll speak as quickly as I can. My name is Leonard Rodberg. I'm a, I was trained as a nuclear physicist and I'm Professor Emeritus of Urban Studies at Queens College. I'm also a member of New York Energy and Climate Advocates, a group recently formed to examine and critique the state's energy and climate policy. Um, the state hired two consultants to develop plans for how the state should respond to the new, its new climate law and what they found and reported to the Climate Action Council in the last several months is that the largest single source of energy under these plans will be offshore wind, which we're talking about today. The downstate area where we live um, it will be almost totally dependent on offshore wind, up to 80% according to the results of these two consultants. Um, I don't know if I said that the sources for everything I'm saying are in my printed testimony. Um, the, there's little open land in our area for solar and wind on the land, so we're dependent on the offshore wind. Wind is full of contradictions. Sometimes there's too little. The, the agency NISO that runs the electric grid for the city found that there will be days and even weeks when there's inadequate energy coming from offshore to, to provide the, sort, the power we need in the downstate region, they did not have a solution to this. They labeled something renewable natural gas, but that doesn't exist and it's kind of a rhetorical device. At the other extreme, the wind farms we're talking about lie directly in the path of the storms that come through every summer and that we know will get more intense and more frequent as, this, as the climate continues to warm. The wind turbines uh, will automatically shut down when those storms come through to protect themselves. But if the storms are strong enough, the, the turbines are, are rated up to category three. A category five storm, the Hurricane Maria took, hit Puerto Rico two years ago and destroyed the wind farm there. It's conceivable over the next 30 years that we will be hit by such a storm and New York City will be dead for up to a decade. Uh, we need reliable backup and it, it exists. We have to build it, it's nuclear power, which today provides 30% of the state's electricity, but it appears nowhere in the state's energy plans up to this point. In fact, the only plant in this downstate area, nuclear plant is, is in the process of being shut down by the Cuomo administration and replaced by gas being burned at Ravenswood and every place else in this city. It, has, it provided 25% of our electricity for the last 50 years, uh, twice as much, even one I of the fine. reactors there. Well, I urge the council to, to support the expansion of nuclear power if you want to save this city. Thank you very much for your testimony, Professor. Okay. Thank you Thank very you. much. And now I would now like to welcome Bonnie Brady of Long Island Fisherman. Starting time. Can you all hear me? Yes. Great. Um, Councilman Constantides, thank you so much for 
asking me to speak to your group today. It's very important. I'm Bonnie Brady. I'm from the Long Island Commercial Fishing Association. I represent commercial fishermen throughout Long Island through a multitude of gear, uh, gear groups. And I would love to have about 30 minutes, honestly, to talk to you about the issues that relate to offshore wind as it involves the ocean environment and the ocean ecosystems. I don't mean to be the uh, wet blanket on today's hearing. However, there is no silver bullet and there is no free lunch. And unfortunately, a lot of the information that you have heard to date does not actively explain offshore wind, whether the difference between nameplate and capacity, whether the difference between what is necessary for pile driving and jet plowing and jet trenching the ocean floor, juicing the ocean floor with electromagnetic frequency and laying thousands and thousands of miles of transmission cables upon it. I have unfortunately about three pages of notes, but it looks like I've got a minute 58. So there's no way I'm going to be able to get that involved. So I have some pictures that I ran around to get for you. Then I don't know if you can see this. Can you all see that? That's the yes. sediment. Yes, great. These are sediment plumes as seen from space by NASA of the Thanet wind farm area, one of the very first wind farms done by Dong Energy, now known as Orsted. This is radar interference in that same wind farm because the uh, magnets and the rare earth minerals inside the turbines create their own magnetic field, which affects radar for most fishermen. Um, the problem that the commercial fishermen have with the plan as it stands for the wind energy areas is they forgot to remove traditional and historic fishing grounds. This map shows the wind energy areas listed in black and also the ones in Rhode Island and Massachusetts. And the orange you see here is actually where fishermen fish. Those are, oh, I'm sorry. I, I can send all of this information to you by, by the way. These are traditional and historic fishing grounds. And the Block Island Wind Farm Project for locally, for those that off of Montauk, the five wind turbines that are on the radar here, five ghost turbines here. There are huge problems with offshore wind. First of all, not removal of traditional historic fishing grounds because frankly, you cannot eat energy. You can, however, destroy your food security. And in the time of COVID, I think we've all learned how important it is to have access to high quality protein. Um, gosh, there's so much to say and I, I'm not gonna be able to fit it all in. However, um, I can tell you that when I heard about the wind farms, the output decreases by 4.5% per year for the first 10 years. Nameplate is about, what, 100 megawatts. The actual capacity for offshore wind is 38% of that. You need gas 24-7 for backup. There is no way to create that kind of ability for the amount of wind that's necessary. And there are many economic, I mean, excuse me, ecological issues that I would love to talk to your committee at further length in any format whatsoever. Thank you so much for your time. I thank you so much for your testimony and please email me all that information. You, I think you have my email. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We have two witnesses left, Linda Nguyen and Catherine Skopik, who will be the last witness. So Linda Nguyen, could you please testify now? She's with a lie. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much for the opportunity to provide testimony on this important subject. My name is Linda Wing, and I'm the senior policy and research analyst at Align, the Alliance for Greater New York. Uh, since the beginning of the pandemic, Alliance convened local community groups working on the front lines of both economic and environmental injustice through the coalition um, uh, Climate Works for All to envision what an equitable recovery for all could look like. Um, our climate and community stimulus platform provides a roadmap on how the city can navigate both the crises we are facing right now. Now more than ever, it's integral that the city prioritizes community-led projects for the creation of good local union jobs in frontline black and community, black and brown communities, and the investment in renewable energy. Economic recovery in the age of COVID-19 and climate change means that we cannot afford for climate adaptation and economic growth to be addressed in silos. Economic injustice, environmental racism, and public health disparities will worsen as the climate crisis progresses in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. New York City must prioritize and invest in renewable energy efforts in environmental justice communities most impacted by climate change, the COVID-19 pandemic, and racial violence. 
investment in infrastructure directed at low-income communities is not only a popular idea, but is also a proven economic stimulus that will put our city back on track towards a robust recovery. Strong community organizing and smart policy research has already highlighted what the city research or city needs to do. And I think we've heard a lot from these great community organizations um, thus far this morning. Offshore wind is a necessary part of the local implementation of the CLCPA. New York City's access to waterways and ports makes it a prime destination for offshore wind development. Investing in Sunset Park's industrial waterfront can not only create the right kind of jobs that would impact frontline communities, but would also address climate mitigation, adaptation, and recovery. Port upgrades would help Sunset Park in the industrial waterfront in creating these tens of thousands of good local career union jobs and help the city increase its resiliency in its local and regional supply chains. I think at the end of the day, good climate policy is good labor policy. The plan within itself, as many have mentioned before me, would create hundreds of, um, hundreds of jobs every year in initial staging and then onwards with management and then indirectly an additional six, 60 to 100 jobs through contracting needs. Um, you know, our city is looking for a way out of this crisis and New York has the opportunity to lead the way, especially in investing in infrastructure that directly impacts low income, environmental justice, black and brown communities. Um, we cannot return to pre-COVID-19 New York. We must uh, move towards an equitable recovery for all and we must implement solutions that center New York's environmental justice communities in these solutions. Um, thank you for your time and your opportunity to testify today and, and for me to provide my testimony. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your testimony today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for all the work that you did. Thank you. And now we'll have Catherine Skopek, who's our final witness. Starting time. Okay. Thank you, Chair Constantinides, Samara Swanston, Nick, all the council members and all those tech people and everyone who has made this virtual hearing possible. Uh, as Samara said, my name is Catherine Skopik. I'm speaking as a citizen and I'm also chair of Sierra Club New York City Group and work with the climate crisis <laughs> policy. Um, yes, we need offshore wind. We all know we are in a climate crisis. And these megawatts are huge. And you have heard all morning all of the positive aspects to the EJ communities, to labor uh, that can benefit and can only benefit us. I have carefully followed the BOEM studies and the so extensive thorough studies on all the marine life uh, in our oceans that will and could be affected uh, down to the, the migration of the Atlantic uh, the Atlantic whales, the Atlantic gray whales. So I am 100% behind these projects. Um, we are geographically uh, blessed to have uh, be on the continental shelf and to have a proven exuberant, generous uh, wind uh, energy coming constantly. The wind uh, flows very strongly. Um, although this is a city uh, issue that we're addressing today, uh, as one who has been studying climate crisis policy on all levels, I would like to report to you that in the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis Report on page not 59, we read, develop a national offshore wind transmission plan. As you all know, we now have three transmission plans in the United States, from the East Coast to the Rockies, from the Rockies to the West Coast and Texas. So uh, the, the federal government is looking to install transmission lines along the coast, which would uh, enable us to transfer uh, the, the, tra uh, the energy from the offshore wind. Um, provide on page 138, provide uh, grants to expedite port electrification, reduce emissions from port operations and upgrade uh, and upgrade points for offshore wind development. Page 140, make energy efficient offshore wind servicing vessels eligible for federal loan grants. And there's more, I've just read a few of those. So the federal, this is looking down the road. These are plans, tentative plans in the works from the federal level to supply grants and financing to enable offshore wind. And in all due respect to the mayor, I would just like to say that the uh, mega dams, the uh, Hydro-Quebec, the Chippy, would be extremely destructive, not only to the indigenous people in Canada, but to the Hudson River 
And I would just like uh, implore him to please stop negotiating on this issue and let us use the renewable energy that is truly renewable. Thank you, everyone. Yay, offshore wind. Thank you, Catherine. Always good to see you. Please stay safe. <laughs> and you too. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. At this time, I'd like to ask if there's anyone who has registered for testify to testify, but whose name I have not called. Is there anyone who registered to testify who has not been called? <clears throat> okay. Uh, seeing none, I will turn it over to Chair Constantinides for any closing remarks. I just want to make sure I thank everyone who took the time to testify today on this important issue. Uh, I want to again thank our staff, our staff attorney, Samara Swanston, uh, for hosting the hearing today. Uh, our staff, our, our policy analysts, both Nadia Johnson and Nikki Chawla, uh, our financial analyst, uh, John Seltzer, my staff, uh, Nicholas Wazowski, all the great sergeant at arms that helped make this stat, this hearing run so well, all the tech folks who don't don't get named, who do all the great work behind the scenes. I appreciate you and thank you. Um, and I also want to make sure two things. One, um, that I wish everyone a happy, safe, socially distant Thanksgiving. Uh, I've had COVID. Um, it is serious. And we need to stay safe this Thanksgiving. Um, there was a lot more of me in March when you last saw me. I lost 30 pounds. I'm still struggling to get the weight back on. So I implore everyone, please, please, let's stay safe this Thanksgiving holiday and not travel and stay socially distant. Uh, and I hope that we can all get together once it's safe. And then secondly, I want to pass condolences on to the family of uh, former Mayor, uh, Mayor David Dinkins. Uh, he was a giant city government. Uh, he was someone who planted so many of the seeds that have come to fruition today that never got the credit for it. Um, so I really want to thank uh, Mayor Dinkins for his service to this city and um, uh, wish him rest in peace and his family, their, my deepest condolences. Uh, so with that, again, thank you to everyone who testified today. And uh, with my imaginary gavel, I will gavel this community hearing of the Environmental Protection Committee uh, closed. <laughs>